good morning and good afternoon in india it is now evening and in us it is morning so both together uh, to this session uh, marketing in a disrupted world uh, and uh, i really uh, gratefully acknowledge uh, and uh, express my gratefulness to the all of you for accepting my invitation and uh, joining this session uh, we are having a great uh, panel today we have with us professor russell belk professor russell belk is an american business academic currently a distinguished research professor in the craft food canada chair in marketing as a police school of business hardly needs any introduction uh, professor belk is a leading authority in consum uh, consumption consumer culture consumer behavior materialism collective giving and so on and in 2017 he was elected to the royal order of canada one of the highest honors that can be bestowed on researchers in canada we welcome you sir thank you very much uh, actually i'm in canada rather than uh, america although i am still uh, an american citizen as it happens sir we have with us uh, okay. our second to speaker today uh, professor roland rust Professor Rust is distinguished university professor and holds the David Bruce Smith Chair in Marketing at the Smith School of, School of Business, University of Maryland, uh, and he is the first business professor to be named a distinguished university professor at Maryland. He is one of the three people who have been named a fellow of both the American Marketing Association and the European Marketing Academy, uh, and uh, he. Uh, was the editor of journal of marketing journal of service research and international journal of research in marketing he has global consulting practice and comments on service issues on television radios and in press so he will be talking about today artificial intelligence negotiating marketing challenges in the disrupted world uh, we have privilege to have our third speaker professor victoria pretenden Professor Pretenden is a professor of marketing at Babson College. Additionally, she serves as visiting global scholars in many leading business schools in US and Europe. Uh, she spent 25 five years in the marketing department of Babson College, where she served as department chair for nine years and chair of MBA core faculty for three years. Uh, professor Pretenden is the recipient recently that happened, I think, in July, uh, the lifetime achievement award given by AME. In 2021, I guess in July 21st, July is not I, I got if I remember correctly, and presently she serves as an editor of Journal of Marketing Education in, in, in a journal. Uh, we welcome you, ma'am. She will be talking uh, talking about the transdisciplinary uh, future of marketing education. We are having privilege to have with us Professor Justin Paul. Professor Justin Paul uh, serves as editor in chief. Of International Journal of Consumer Studies, and as Associate Editor of Journal of Business Research, a former faculty member with the University of Washington, he serves as full professor of, of a PhD and MBA programs in University of Puerto Rico, USA, and holds concurrent appointments at Henley Business School, University of Reading, for three years. He holds three honorary titles as distinguished professors in reputed institutions. Uh, we welcome you, sir. He will be uh, talk, uh, talking about the topic, building premium brands among uncertainty, the mastery marketing way. And lastly, uh, uh, I would like to introduce you, already introduced, Professor J.K. Das, our director who is behind this conference. And Professor Das uh, is the director of our institutions. And he is the founder, uh, dean of IIM Lucknow Noida campus. We welcome you, sir. So I over to Professor Das, and uh, after brief speech, we'll be going to the uh, lectures. Thank you, uh, Professor Nirmalya. Um, uh, it's a really a privilege for me to welcome the four uh, distinguished uh, academics uh, who are here with us in this uh, panel uh, to talk about uh, the theme of this particular session titled uh, Overcoming Challenges in Marketing in a Disrupted uh, Marketplace. Uh, we are all uh, a marketing uh, professional 
and we all have uh, uh, you know gone through the disruption uh, particularly uh, pushed in by the uh, pandemic uh, across the world and we have all seen and gone through what we call the lockdown conditions where you uh, stay put in your house uh, and then slowly slowly people are starting shifting towards uh, online activity and online purchase and home deliveries and a lot of companies started uh, facing issues and problems of uh, revenues because of the lockdown so we all have seen this uh, a lot of some of the economies are uh, coming back and some of the economies are uh, still struggling in the world to uh, handle the uh, the situation of uh, disruption in the market uh, that happened because of the uh, pandemic but we know as a marketing professional that the disruption is not new to the marketing uh, area uh, disruptions are, are are always happening whenever a new technology comes in or new ways of doing things uh, come in uh, the disruptions uh, will happen uh, these disruptions we can say in terms of how, what we understand by disruption is when any when any new thing comes in uh, the traditional uh, standards are uh, changed uh, the 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 standard ways of the past undergoes a change uh, whenever uh, some such thing happens uh, the changes will happen of a drastic nature we call this is as essentially a disruption that is uh, taking place and which is also a challenge uh, for the marketers as well as a opportunity for the marketers we have seen examples of uh, the current times where uh, uh, the the newer disruptions coming in because of the technology uh, has brought about uh, uh, we also have used the term uh, when the disruptions happen then some people some smart people find new solutions to the uh, new problems which is coming up and the term very commonly used is the uh, disruptive innovation so because of the new products and new technology and new ways of doing things coming in uh, somebody is able to identify the friction or the bottlenecks in the consumption experience of the uh, consumers or the entire uh, process of uh, marketing uh, which undergoes uh, some uh, friction points or pain points uh, there are some people who are able to identify a smarter a newer and a better solution to improve the uh, the, the marketing flow of uh, goods and services and enhance the experience of the uh, consumers so so these uh, digital uh, innovations uh, brought in the new ways of doing business the classic example that we have before us is the example of uh, uber and ola taxi cabs the airbnb and the oyo and the likes of many similar examples so this is how things have uh, changed in the recent past and we as marketing professionals have to look at as to how this uh, disruptions are bringing in changes in the marketing practices uh, the disruptions uh, can be in the terms of the uh, product could be in terms of the marketing uh, activities so we have the four learned speakers uh, who will be sharing their views uh, oriented around these um, uh, disruptions uh, so i see these challenges uh, also in the perspective of uh, opportunity for uh, marketers so we will uh, proceed in the same uh, sequence as has been scheduled in this uh, uh, program and as was uh, shared earlier on before we started today uh, in this particular session that uh, looking at the time constraint uh, uh, we will have about i would say 15 to 20 minutes uh, for each speaker uh, so that uh, we are able to snatch some time for any uh, questions and answers uh, towards the uh, end so i'll be grateful uh, if we can conclude our part uh, each one of us in within maximum uh, uh, 20 minutes and uh, with these uh, sense of gratitude i uh, first invite uh, professor russell belk to share his views on the death of marketing and its possible reincarnation professor let me try without the headphones is that any better no it's better much better yeah. much better okay what i'm saying is i'm trying to share my screen and it's not allowing me it says share content i choose screen and we cannot display your shared content. Please make sure you've allowed permission to share content and try again. Yeah, it worked fine yesterday. You can uh, share. Let it. us just coordinate with the technical staff over here. Just okay, thank minutes. you. Or we can change the order if uh, that will help solve the technical problem. Yeah. 
Professor Das, can we switch the order? Sorry? I would be happy to go ahead if you wanted to um, switch the order. Yeah, that's okay. fine. You need to unmute go. yourself. Let, let Roland go first then. I just need to be able to Professor share Das, you screen. need to unmute yourself. If you're speaking, we can't hear you. Uh, Professor Roland Rust, uh, uh, maybe you could uh, uh, start. Uh, can everybody see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Good. Uh, yeah, my talk is about uh, artificial intelligence negotiating marketing challenges in a disrupted world. Uh, artificial intelligence, as I think everybody realizes at this point, is a hugely important technological development that's changing everything. Oops. Okay. And I'd like to um, first of all thank uh, Ming Hui Huang, who is uh, my co author on virtually everything, almost everything I do with AI. And uh, she's a professor at National Taiwan University. She's also my wife. Um, and she's currently the editor of the Journal of Service Research. She's been very involved with, with all of this as well. I'd like to first of all point out the uh, the new book that Minghui and I have written called The Feeling Economy, How Artificial Intelligence is Creating the Ear of Empathy. I'll be talking a little bit about that during this talk so you can see what uh, what the main ideas of that book are. But uh, I, I would uh, uh, strongly encourage uh, everyone to uh, check that book out because it's very broad and uh, talks about a lot of uh, controversial issues with respect to artificial intelligence. And it's uh, also, I, I believe, an easy read, even though uh, I hope that uh, you'll find that there are many ideas in there. So um, the disrupted world, uh, I think we're all aware that things are really changed. And a lot of what's happened, of course, is the COVID pandemic. In the news this morning was, uh, was an even uh, perhaps worse variant coming out of uh, South Africa. And uh, so, I mean, the, the, the pandemic is really um, creating a lot of problems worldwide. We all know that. And this, this means that we have less work done face to face. So for example, uh, uh, most of the speakers, maybe all of the speakers are not in New Delhi right now. And, and that, is, uh, that is more how things are, are going today. And when I've been teaching in the last couple of years, of course, I've been teaching online. Uh, and, and in fact, a lot of meetings are happening online and, and conferences. So, um, so this is, uh, this is something that is, uh, is a huge trend. And, and also, uh, more work tasks are being automated. And of course, uh, you know, why, why are they automated? Well, one of the reasons is uh, that uh, you don't want to have people do things face to face. If you don't want to want things to be face to face, then you you automate stuff, make things automatic, uh, and and do it online. So uh, so this is increasing the pressure to implement artificial intelligence methods. And what I want to argue is that uh, the result of this is not going to be uh, basically what everybody is saying. So it's uh, important to talk about. Uh, jobs, tasks, and labor, because that's uh, really what people are involved with. So uh, a job would be like, for example, a customer service manager. But then there are tasks within the job. So for example, the customer service manager may have some daily routines or may uh, communicate and empathize with customers, et cetera. And you can see that those tasks really involve different skills. And so uh, then we have uh, labor to uh, accomplish those tasks. And the labor can either be human labor uh, uh, or, as we'll see later, it, it, the AI can do a lot of what humans used to do. So what I'm going to be most concerned about, of course, being a human being myself, is the human part. You know, what are humans going to be doing? So here's the bottom line from uh, our feeling economy book, which is, I think, a strange idea. When AI does the thinking, humans will emphasize feeling. 
And that sounds strange because we think about, oh, AI is coming in, all these technological developments, therefore people will be more and more technical. And, and we're saying, no, it'll be exactly the opposite of that. People will be less technical. They will emphasize the things that humans are better than computers at. So it, it's useful to think about three different uh, AI intelligences, more or less in the order that they've been developed. First of all, uh, physical intelligence. Uh, and uh, that's uh, really uh, the, the ability to do heavy duty physical things. So for example, in, in the old days, people would uh, go down and uh, into coal mines and, and do, do coal mining. They would be on uh, assembly lines for manufacturing. And today, a lot of that is done by uh, robots of one sort or another. So, uh, so the physical economy has really uh, gone away. Uh, and humans were forced to then do other things. So as uh, things like farming and mining and coal mining and, uh, and manufacturing uh, became less opportunities for human jobs, uh, humans were forced to try to develop more thinking skills. And that was why education became very, very much uh, bigger in the uh, 1900s than, than it was in the 1800s because people needed to develop those thinking skills. And now we're moving to a, a third phase, uh, moving from the current thinking economy to what we refer to as the feeling economy. And this is because AI is starting to do a lot of those thinking tasks. And as AI does more of the thinking tasks, then people are forced to uh, work on what they're better at, which is feeling. So uh, here, here's, um, here it is just briefly in pictures. If you take a look at uh, the physical economy, uh, if you look at the left panel, the left panel is sort of how cars used to be built. Uh, even when I visited China in 1997, and went to a car factory there, that was what it looked like. And, uh, but that's not what it looks like today in China, and it's not what it looks like anywhere else in the world, really. If you look at the right panel, that's what's happening with uh, car manufacturing today. It's all done by robots. You might be able to find a person in that photo, but it's pretty difficult. I think there's there's a person, I think. But, uh, but basically, there's not very many people there. What, what's happened in recent years, which is so important, is that AI is becoming uh, much, much better at thinking. So for example, AI uh, won the... Um, game of Jeopardy, a quiz show, beating the super champions that were human champions. So AI proved that it, and this was an, an IBM uh, AI computer, uh, proved that it was, it was simply better. And, and that's not just true in Jeopardy. Uh, it is now to the point where all of the best uh, computer chess programs can crush the best human chess players. It can also beat the best goal players. So, uh, so this is uh, this is clearly a warning to humans that we aren't going to be able to dominate thinking forever. And in fact, uh, it's really starting to to go away. So, what's left for humans? This is uh, what we need to be worried about. And what skills will be more important? Which will be less important? Well. Um, Based on AI taking over more thinking skills, uh, the human analytical skills will be less important. Now, I'm not saying analytical skills will be less important because it'll, it'll still be very important. It'll be more important than ever. But uh, Louis, AI if, will uh, be doing it. AI will be doing uh, the analytical skills, not humans. So uh, as as analytical skills become less important, then, then people start to rely on intuition and empathy. These are people skills that uh, computers are not as good at uh, yet. But then even the intuition will be less important because that is a thinking uh, skill. And uh, empathy will become the most valuable service skill. And eventually even empathy will decline in importance as AI gets better at feeling skills. And uh, there, there's, there's a lot of uh, 
for example, in the most recent issue of Scientific American, there's a big article about how uh, feeling skills are being uh, trained into AI. And that is, uh, that is something that's coming, but it's gonna be a few decades before the uh, feeling AI is so good that it's, it's as good as we are. So uh, we build a theory of uh, AI job replacement and um, to try to predict how AI will impact human service jobs. I'm gonna go quickly over this because I don't have that much time, but here are the stages of job replacement. First of all, the mechanical jobs start to go away. Then the analytical jobs go away, then the intuitive jobs, and then the empathetic jobs. And, and that, is, uh, that is in fact what we're seeing. And so the relative importance for human service providers, mechanical is less important. Analytical is now to the point of becoming less important. And intuitive will soon become less important. And empathetic eventually will be clearly the most important thing. So uh, we tried to validate this with the United States government data. And uh, this was data for a whole lot of jobs. And we had tasks. Uh, each job was rated on 41 tasks in terms of the importance for that job. And um, uh, we sorted those things into physical thinking and feeling, uh, which is along the lines of the, uh, of the three uh, economies, the physical economy, the thinking economy, and the feeling economy. And you see that the feeling skills are a lot of communication and interpersonal stuff. The thinking skills is what you would imagine, you know, the analyzing and stuff like that. And the physical skills are uh, a lot more, uh, as, as you would guess, physical. So um, now if you take a look at the relative importance of these uh, tasks and intelligences, in 2016, thinking uh, skills were, were still more important than anything else. But the change in task importance from 2006 to 2016 shows what's happening really. What's happening is that feeling skills are becoming a lot more important over time. And thinking skills more or less staying the same, physical skills becoming less important. And, um, and we see this really across all kinds of different jobs, uh, even very technical jobs like uh, financial jobs. And, and so um, basically when lower intelligence is de-emphasized, higher intelligence is emphasized. So, uh, these, these big, strong physical guys had to become uh, more thinking task people. And uh, also feeling, feeling intelligence, employment and wages are growing. So here's the employment change uh, from 2006 to 2016. You would look at this, uh, uh, this graph and you would say, wow, it looks like feeling tasks are just as important as STEM skills. And that's true, but how many schools do you see that are emphasizing feelings tasks? Not too many, I think that's a market opportunity. And if you take a look at the wage change from 2006 to 2016, the wages are increasing faster for feeling skills than they are for thinking skills. So we're heading toward uh, the feeling economy. And this means that employees need to be more feeling oriented as everybody's more feeling oriented then employees need to be more feeling oriented too. You, you need to, uh, to display that empathy. That's gonna be our differential advantage. That's the thing a computer can't do as well. And more consumers, as I said, are more feeling oriented. And you notice one thing that this person has in, in her hand, it's a smartphone. And what smartphone? It's basically AI in her pocket. And what that means is that a lot of the thinking tasks that she used to have to do in her head, now can be done in her, in her AI. And that means that even she doesn't have to be as thinking oriented as she need, used to be. So this reinforces itself as consumers become more emotionally conscious, employees become more emotionally intelligent, which then uh, feeds into consumers being even more emotionally conscious. And creativity uh, is also becoming more feeling oriented for humans. Here we see uh, an example of uh, a creative uh, situation in music. And on the left side, you see a lot of computing. You know, these are sequencers and, uh, and synthesizers and all that is programmed. Uh, it's basically AI. And a lot of popular music is mostly AI. 
But then what usually is done is they put a singer that's on the right side, the singer over the top of the kind of cold AI driven uh, synthesizer mix. And uh, the human tries to make up for the coldness by trying to be warmer and even more emotional, try to exaggerate the emotion. So you see these, uh, the face paint and the expressions and all this on the singer on the right side, that's to make up for the coldness of the AI. So basically what's happening right now in popular music, and this is happening in a lot of scenarios, is that uh, humans are collaborating with AI. That is, that is what's happening both uh, can you click your uh, your mute button, please? Uh, we got got some noise here. Okay, uh, but this is a collaborative process between humans and AI, and th we're seeing this over and over in in uh, in all kinds of scenarios. So implications for business education. First of all, I think this this ought to put a couple of big question marks on this idea of focusing totally on analytics programs. I know that's really uh, popular right now, but I think counter-programming would be more successful. Going more for feeling intelligence would be a market opportunity where you're counter-programming against everybody else, you're counter-positioning. So maybe emphasizing people's skills more is what business education should do. It also means that we need to retrain workers with poor people skills. So, for example, these geeks and nerds that are uh, very, very uh, analytical, and I'm one of those. You know, I've had, I started out in mathematics. You know, they, they may need to be retrained to develop their uh, people skills better. Now, uh, one uh, interesting possibility from this is that maybe this gives women the advantage. Because uh, women, because of their traditional uh, roles in uh, raising children uh, tend to have more empathy, better people skills. So uh, if if uh, the feeling economy is really uh, in charge, which we believe it will be in the next 10 to 15 years, uh, then what will happen here is that women are likely to be more important than ever before in, in business. We've already seen this. I mean, we already see this. Uh, in the in the 1900s, women became much more important in society um, because uh, their physical disadvantage didn't matter anymore. But now it's not only that they don't have a disadvantage; they actually have an advantage, I believe. And uh, and this this will be the the time for women to be uh, in in major roles. Um, Another thing, another conclusion is that marketers should study irrationality and emotion more. You know, the, the economic assumption that everybody's a rational person, and that's probably not right anymore, and it probably should be thrown out. Of course, marketers have realized this for a long time, and economists have realized it for maybe uh, 20 years. Um, uh, so, Professor Rust, uh, yep. you have taken 18 minutes so far. Okay, well, I'm just about ready. To yeah. finish up, and that is um, for managers. Uh, I believe uh, the importance is to recruit for people skills, not analytics, and uh, create new jobs that emphasize feeling intelligence. And we want to take our existing jobs and make them more feeling oriented. So, to conclude, and I believe that will get within your 20 minute <laughs> instruction, <laughs> to conclude, the thinking economy will soon become the feeling economy. And in fact, it's already becoming the feeling economy you can see from our empirical data. Uh, it's moving very strongly in that direction. The feeling economy will change what we do and who we are. And the disrupted world will soon be even more disrupted by AI. And thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Professor Russ. That was a wonderful uh, presentation and an entirely uh, new perspective. I mean, is a, a new age uh, concept that you know they ultimately move over to a feeling economy. Uh, we'll sure we'll have more on this, uh, but without further loss of time, uh, can we have uh, Professor Belk uh, uh, back on the screen now, please? Can you share your screen, Professor Belk? Is this okay now? 
Uh, you are, you have to unmute yourself. Man. Yeah. Uh, no, you you uh, uh, no no no. You have to unmute unmute. Uh, gone back to mute. Please unmute. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah yeah. Now it's okay. Okay. I'm trying to share and uh, I'm getting the same error again. Oh, I've sent my so slides via Dropbox, but it'll be another 30 minutes before they're able to upload. Oh, okay. We are, we are coordinating with the computer center. Once we receive the slides from Professor Belk, we'll put from our side. Okay, in, in that case, case uh, we have, other we, we have uh, Professor uh, Victoria Clinton. Would you be fine making the presentation, please? Yes. Professor Victoria? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, visible. Your slides are visible. Okay, we're good. Yeah, yeah, good, 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 good to go. It's excellent. Please go ahead. Uh, pardon? Uh, please continue. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. I was uh, very intrigued by what Roland was talking about, and I was uh, taking a, a lot of notes because I think. Um, many of his conclusions tie to what um, I'll be talking about as far as what I'm referring to as the transdisciplinary future of marketing education. And um, I had hoped to also follow Russ Belk because I have a uh, extreme amount of benign envy for all of his success in the world too. So I, I talk about uh, benign envy all the time. So um, <laughs> This was a, it's a great honor to, to be on the stage with, with all of you, and I'm excited to be here. And as, as, as you know from the topic of my talk, I have a, a very intense interest in um, marketing wow. education. And I'd like to start the talk. I, I, I do want to preface it by saying that um, when I was thinking about my talk for today, and um, I think when I think about marketing education in general, I also, I tend to take um, COVID out of the picture because when I'm talking about uh, the transdisciplinary future of marketing education, I talk a lot about technology. And as you're going to see today, a lot of that came, uh, came about before COVID. So while COVID pushed uh, all of us into uh, rapid pivoting to go online, you know, and and Roland mentioned, you know, his teaching and his meetings for the past couple of years. From a educational technology standpoint, we've been um, hitting this, uh, I guess, what I would call the technology wall for um, over a decade now. And and when I think about um, marketing edu education, I think about us as us as educators, uh, purveyors of information. And that we have long had to uh, engage in what I call on demand marketing education. And I know many of us in the educational world hate to think of our uh, students as customers. So I'm going to uh, skirt around that. I'll slide around that a little bit and, and not try to get you in that mind because that's not the, uh, the debate that I think we need to be getting into. I think what we need to think about as far as um, the future of education and us as faculty and, and our students is we we have to though apply some of the um, the customer thinking that that we do out in the uh, non-academic world and when we do that i i always think of um this idea of now students want to act any anywhere um at any time they want it now we used to talk about this in our uh uh, distribution. We used to talk about it with our, our channels and we used to talk about just in time. Well, the students are the same way, just like customers. They want they want it now and they want it anywhere. And um, to think of it as a can I, students want the tools that are going to be deployed effectively in a way that creates value for them. If if you you could you take this wording and you can transfer it into into basically any any uh, marketplace environment and students as as we hear time and time again are thinking about for me the idea that students expect material to be targeted precisely to their needs 
and they want those um they want that material personalized for their own experiences and um uh, I could give you some examples of how we try to do that, but I think uh, all of you are engaged in that. But the interesting part on this, and um, it likely goes back to you know what Roland was talking about, the students, just like customers, want it uh, simply. They want all their interactions with us as faculty members to actually be easy. And when it's not easy, you know, let's say when we're having problems with with WebEx, you know, if I'm the faculty member, then I feel like that's that's my responsibility. But the reality is, we're relying on this um, this almost third party platform to to work. And so sometimes the ease of use doesn't always work the way we want it to. But we have to keep I always say that we have to keep that in mind because uh, we as educators, actually, I, I feel like our mission as an educator is to engage challenge and inspire. And when I said we've been doing this for over a decade, I actually um, have a little bit um, for someone who was never really interested in, if you will, traditional history, when it comes to um, looking at history as where we've been as, as marketing educators, I'm always digging into that. And um, back as early as I put a, a a uh, reference up here of 2001, but but by the beginning of 2000, um, it was being talked about that one of our biggest challenges as educators is that we were speaking an outdated language. And we were speaking that outdated language because we struggled to, uh, we were struggling to engage with our students in the world of technology. I think back to some of the, um, the early interactive platforms, and um, I personally looked at those and thought of them as um, just for fun. I had three sons who, um, you know, were growing up in that particular time period, and I felt like it was always just for activities of fun. But then, even even soon thereafter, we were talking about that education was one of the institutions most deserving of disruption and that there were so many opportunities for us to disrupt ourselves. And I'm gonna stay right there that I think, and I'm speaking for, I'll just speak for myself. I, I'll confess that I think I failed to disrupt myself early on. I, you know, it was like a, a miracle when I was using PowerPoint slide. I felt like, you know, I was, I was really kicking you know, I was rocking it when I learned how to, you know, maneuver some fancy things on PowerPoint, but we weren't taking advantage of the opportunities that were there. And in some of um, some research that I, I worked on with one of our uh, publishing companies, and, and we actually found that not just marketers, but across the board, whether it was in um, arts and humanities, whether it was in the sciences, whether it was in business schools, that we were failing, and this was around 2009, 2010, when we were collecting data, um, we were failing to harness the power of the capabilities that we have, the, the electronic infrastructure. We were, we were failing to take advantage of that. And then the, even as I put this up here, 2013, thinking about old, what one author used as old fashioned instructional, practices. I think when, when I read that one, um, I was like, we, I, I hate to think of myself as old fashioned, but I suspect that uh, that's what we were doing. We were uh, showing our age. And then as recent as 2015, so not that long ago, we were being told that um, university marketing departments were behind the curve. And so when I look at that and, and I think about disruption within an educational environment, um, it makes me question how much we have failed to engage, challenge, and inspire our students because are we really behind the curve or, you know, is Vicki Crittenden really old fashioned and am I, am, am I showing my age? And so, um, With that, um, 
we we sort of fast forward, you know, after 2015 and and really focused, I think we as educators behind the curve really started to focus on technology. And we um, were looking at how we could refresh our curriculum, re refresh our programs, and um, what teaching opportunities were being uh, made available to us. Mark Uncles back in 2018, I thought, really expressed, them, expressed this very well. And um, when he was talking about the opportunities in the higher education landscape, and the title of this talk, I, I put as a transdisciplinary. And I think that's because we, as the educators, actually allowed our publishers to be a, become a major, 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 major stakeholder in what we were doing. We allowed our, we enabled or allowed or enabled our publishers, I feel like, to really take the lead on um, technology enabled teaching and learning opportunities. And um, in, in hindsight, I, somebody had to do it. So I think that, that that particular major stakeholder probably was well equipped for that. So while I was rocking my PowerPoint, they were you know, headed in the direction of actually um, letting us know by 2020 or even before that, that we didn't need hard copy textbooks anymore. That there were certain things that we as educators had been uh, immersing ourselves in that actually were no longer needed. And so I think they became a, a, the, if you will, the digital disruptor for us is because they had the tools to do, to, uh, to enable that way. And then, um, so I think keeping, Keeping that in mind, as far as the digital disruption, and and this goes back to uh, some of the things that um, Rowan was also talking. I, he was talking about, it and I was rapidly translating it to, to to my talk. Is this idea of a work ready student? And we've been told for for quite a while now that. Hiring managers are finding our recent college graduates to be lacking. And I, I now in, in 2021 and headed into 2022 find that um, interesting because these students are the ones who are so engaged in technology. But what I found from my work with students and um, my work in marketing education is that these students know how to use the platforms but that we have not, we're still not enabling our students through our Engage, Inspire, and Challenge initiatives to, um, to use those platforms in a way that um, actually make them work ready. They know how to um, engage with our social media, but are we really preparing them? And I know we have some later sessions at this conference that focus on that. And um, are we really preparing them to be work ready? And a session, I think it's a panel that um, it may be tomorrow's session. I know a friend of mine, Nancy Richmond is on it. And I'm enthralled when I look at what Nancy is doing with her students and one of her colleagues is, is doing with the students at Florida International because they really are focused on being work ready while bringing what we would think of as our marketing theory and our marketing knowledge to the to the forefront. And so I still find it scary when I see a, a quote, and this is just one of many, that um, we're having to turn to IT and statistics students for, for um, our next college graduates to fill our marketing roles. So, and to tie on to that, and um, Roland, I know I keep coming back to your talk, but I recently, engaged with some, and I couldn't even tell you, I promised the faculty that whom I reached out to that um, I wouldn't uh, I, I wouldn't keep track of how many of them I reached out to, but I can tell you that I've heard back from about 60 faculty members. And um, we were talking about the keeping the marketing curriculum up to date. So where Roland was telling us that, um, we were going to need maybe less 
human component of analytics because the AI would be doing that for us. Actually, amongst 60 marketing professors as of this past week, uh, marketing analytics was a course in the curriculum that um, professors thought would be the most needed. And that tied with digital marketing. And the digital marketing to me is just because we are thinking about work ready students. But I was listening to what Roland was saying and I was thinking what we probably should be focused on, this is just my proposition with no background other than putting together thoughts this morning, is we should be engaging with our students in the classroom with topics such as AI. We should integrate, bring forth that digital marketing and have topics such as AI and some of the more uh, technology at the forefront of technology and bringing those to our students in the classroom to keep that marketing curriculum up to date. Whereas approximately 60 marketing professors over the past week have said that marketing analytics was the number one course or tied for number one in our, in our marketing curriculum. The second course behind the tie for analytics and digital marketing, marketing professors were telling me marketing research. The third was marketing strategy and tied for um, the fourth place, I put it as fourth and fifth because consumer behavior came in a little bit later. So was that changing the slide was uh, we had sales and consumer behavior. And it's interesting to me when I look at this list of courses, if you take out the marketing analytics and the digital marketing, we actually have listed four courses that I suspect would have been listed as the top four courses 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, that marketing professors would be telling us we needed these courses. And um, I, I'm, I'm personally, I'm, I'm still pondering that. I'm not sure exactly how I, how I feel about that. I feel like in the, the sales with all the activity that I've seen, and I'm a big uh, follower of people on LinkedIn, when I see all the activity in sales, I feel like that with sales, we are bringing technology. And I know that uh, Stephanie Boyer at Bryant University and her colleagues have been doing a lot with uh, sales technology on a simulation called Rainmakers. And the very foundation of Rainmaker is a um, AI technology. Actually, when I went through a beta test on that, I found out that I would be a horrible salesperson. When I interacted with what was AI, I, I realized I had no clue. But um, when it came to engaging in a sales perspective, which was really scary to me. And so, but, but this brings some concern to me because I, again, building on what Roland was talk about, talking about, and then my thinking about education, maybe we're not, um, where we should be, and it, but it makes me think back in 2019, Bob Peterson at the University of Texas and I uh, ran a couple of special issues on the Journal of Marketing Education, and it was on digital disruption. And I'll confess to you that many of our submissions, we had a lot of great submissions that were on, on, on point, but many of our submissions were not on digital disruption they were on something digital. And so what leads me to, to think about is that, are we really empowering our students? Are we, are we harnessing this uh, technology the way we should? And so um, these are just my thoughts on empowering our students is that we as marketing educators have to stop talking about this cultural distance we, we still talk about digital natives. Oh, 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 oh. And we so, talk about sorry to interrupt. You have consumed 18 minutes so far. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I think I have one more after this, so I'm, I'm wrapping up. We, we have our digital, we had digital natives and we had digital immigrants, but now we should all be digital. We should be empowering our students. 
And I gave a little philosophical comment there that even as teachers, we should have lifelong learning experiences. And I think technology is, is what we have to do there. And uh, teaching and learning disrupted. I think we have to be aware of what the marketing practitioners, that's not anything to, do, to new. We have to be constantly aware of the technologies that are leading to digital disruption. And we have to be very knowledgeable about those and how we can effectively and efficiently, going back to my initial slide, um, educate our students. And I'd like to, like to end this by saying that digital disruption is not a threat. Um, as everyone talks about, it is a, it's not a single, it's less a single event, but basically it's a process that, that does manifest itself over time. And others have said the same thing. That is, it is a continuing process. And um, where Roland was talking about his physical thinking and feeling, I think we need to keep up with that as the educators. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Crittenden. Uh, uh, this is uh, something important that we should not let go. I mean, as the professors, sometimes we assume that we are all good to go, but we should also be aware of the way the world is changing and these uh, te technological disruptions or any disruption that is happening might hit us as well, uh, not the market uh, in that sense. So, so thank you for bringing this up. And we all professors need to take a serious note of this, not only in terms of the content which is lacking in the marketing students, but also in the pedagogy, you know, the way you uh, teach uh, courses. Now, can we go back to Professor Belk? Are things uh, in control now? I need four more minutes for my file to come through on Dropbox. Uh, okay, so, so can we send uh, a message when I try to share? Yeah, sure. So can we have uh, Professor Paul uh, to to start, please? Professor Justin Paul? Oh, you, you are mute. Uh, please unmute yourself, Professor Justin Paul. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now okay, now okay. Okay, so I would request uh, Nirmalia to, I mean, I had uh, he had told me that uh, he can have someone to move my slides. I had sent slides yesterday, so... It should be better in case because I have an Apple Mac with a different configuration. I tried to th this platform is not compatible with my laptop, but but he promised that he can move my slides. So normally, are you there to move my slides? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, 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 I have a, your uh, slide. Uh, I, I'm uh, I'm starting to share. Okay, you can just quickly move. Okay, because I got many slides in twenty minutes, so I I need to move very quickly. Okay, sir. Okay, can I begin with now? Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Das, for this invitation and Nirmalia for this invitation. And it's an honor for me to share some of my thoughts on uh, mass teach marketing and a relatively new concept, which uh, some of you might not have heard about it. And um, I do have this idea because uh, uh, this concept or this uh, process helps companies to think about uh, how to manage their businesses, especially premium brands, how to manage their businesses uh, during the crisis time. Um, can you still hear me? Because there is some kind of power, power problem. So am I still audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah. You are audible. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. So. Um, yeah, so the, the idea behind this concept of mass teach marketing, I got this idea originally uh, about 10 years ago after reading an article published in Harvard Business Review. And uh, I, it, is, it is a relatively new idea and concept for me at that time. But after that, I worked uh, very hard in this area and I published uh, several papers and I developed a scale to estimate uh, uh, mass prestige or mass teach value of different brands and competing brands and compare with competing brands and so on. I have total 10 uh, papers in this area now and published in different journals and some of them, two of my papers uh, got more than 100 citations within one year after uh, published uh, in this area. So, uh, yeah, my uh, idea uh, for today's presentation is based on 
how do we actually think about, especially the premium brands here, I deal with a concept called mass and prestige, brands prestige in the mass market. How do you actually create prestigious brands and how does prestigious brands survive and succeed during the crisis time? Like we have crisis now because of COVID pandemic. We have recession sometimes. Once in 10 years, there is a recessionary phase of one or two years everywhere in the world. So we have this kind of turbulent times every now and then or every five years we have seen that last, let's say if you look at last 30 years, every five years we have turbulent times. So how does a premium or prestigious brand survive through or succeed uh, during this kind of crisis time once you create a prestige brand? So also how to create a prestige brand. This is another uh, uh, dimension that I have in this, my, in, in this, in this uh, session. Yeah, so uh, there are two factors for classifying, classifying a brand as a prestigious brand and prestige brand and prestigious brand are very similar or you can simply say same. So prestigious brands can be simply called as prestige brands if they are prestigious in the mass market. If majority of the people, majority of the consumers in a market perceive them as prestigious, they, are, they can be simply called as prestige brands. So they can be any premium or any luxury or any prestigious brand. And uh, normally they are priced uh, premium. Just move, just move very quickly. Can you move my slides very quickly? You have to move my slides. Yeah, just go to the next slide. Every 10 seconds you have to move. Otherwise we cannot do this slide, this presentation in 20 minutes. So, yeah, so premium price is a function of product place and promotion strategies. The mastage marketing theory, the mastage marketing notion is based on a very fundamental principle premium price that you can charge provided your product place promotion strategies are appropriate and scientific. Move on. Yeah, and mastage theory is based on a fundamental question how do you create? prestige, keeping prices high and constant, and is it possible to create mass prestige? If you keep your prices high and constant, do still people and customers or consumers will buy your products or buy your brand in case uh, if you keep prices high? So, and how do you do that? And how do you achieve customers? Or how do you retain customers? And how do you get customers if your prices are high? So premium price is a function of mass prestige, and mass prestige is a function of product promotion and play strategy. So mastage marketing can be defined with the help of these two equations. Yeah, move on. So some of the mastage brands are Starbucks, Singapore Airways, Apple in emerging markets, Armani, Louis Vuitton, Swiss watches, etc. And the success of mastage marketing to a great extent is based upon how to formulate strategies with reference to other three P's product promotion and place. Do you have a great product and great promotion strategies and play strategies? So here I'm presenting a stage by stage model for mastage marketing. And I would like to call upon the brand managers to try to use this model to survive through their, if you have a premium brand, or if you have a prestigious brand, if you have already created a prestigious or a premium brand, how do you survive or how do you actually go through this uh, crisis time and, and manage your business? This is the idea. A mastage value can be created with uh, some actions and some, and you can see the actions here, product strategies, product differentiation, product, uh, new product launch and new product lines, new product lines. I would like to focus new product lines. Tactical promotion strategy that can include advertisement, strategic advertisement. Strategic advertisement is required and where to advertise is a very fundamental question that you have to see. And uh, you missed very important slides. Maybe you can back to go back to previous slide. That's a very important slide. Yeah, and uh, place or distribution strategies. For example, franchising to reach out to the mass market. Sometimes if you have normally prestigious mark, prestigious brands do not go by franchising. They always go by exclusive distribution strategy, but exclusive distribution is dead during the turbulent times. You cannot do business based on exclusive distribution. You might need to think about franchising. You might need to think about uh, distributing through several direct and indirect channels and such kind of strategies required to create a uh, mass prestigious brand. 
and you might need e-commerce strategies. Also, e-commerce strategy is very critical during the turbulent time, during the recessionary time, uh, during the pandemic time. And uh, traditional prestigious brands, they never focused uh, on e-commerce strategies historically. So e-commerce strategies are very important these days. And they have to create positive word of mouth experience, which is also very, very important and critical to create brand equity and mastage value. So I have conceptualized mastage value as the last step. It is, it is, it is a step or it is a stage or it is a phase after brand equity. Brand equity comes first and after brand equity, you create uh, mastage value. So that means brand equity is a prerequisite for creating mastage value or mass prestige value. So first step is how to create brand equity. And once you have brand equity, you think about mastage or mass prestige value for your brand. Yeah, next. Move on. This is a, my first paper. In case if you want to read, uh, the, the the first paper was titled uh, "Mastage Marketing Redefined and Mapped: Introducing a Pyramid Model and an MMS Measure." One, one. Yeah. So in this paper, what I did was that I tried to develop a scale to measure the mass prestige value of brands and compare the value of competing brands to derive insights on the popularity of the brands. And this paper is based on data from primary data from Japan and France. Yeah. Move on. Uh, go on, go on. So next, next. Uh, so here you can also see top of the mind and research objectives of this paper. It's also include a theoretical model for mass stitch marketing. And mass stitch marketing also requires uh, uh, penetration into middle income group customers and probably even low upper income group customers. Next. Sustained success of a brand is very much required. And in my first study, I used a sample of 590 women who use Louis Vuitton brand. Move on, oh, next. Next. Yeah, the idea was to develop a mass teach mean score scale. So here you can see Louis Vuitton showroom. So they are not only trying to attract the fit in customers, but their target is also to attract the show off customers. So they, they, that means their, their business is, or their marketing is a function of show off customers plus fit in customers, both. So mass teach requires, mass teach strategy requires both category of customers, fit in customers plus show off customers. For example, I have a friend uh, who has a BMW and this gentleman does not have a good job, but he has a new BMW. I asked him, why do you have BMW when you don't have a very good job? So he told me that I want to, I want to make sure that all the girls come and talk to me if, I, if they see a BMW car. So that is called show off. So there are a lot of customers that way, you know, show off customers. So in case if you have to create a mass teach brand, you need not only fit in customers, but also such show off customers. So, because every segment of the mass market is attracted to your brand and they buy your brand. Mass teach marketing. So this is, this is some literature review. I would skip this and move on. Please next, next please. Uh, next, next please. Louis Vuitton is an example for how they created mass teach brand in Japanese market. Japanese market provided about 30 percentage of worldwide revenue for Louis Vuitton for 25 years, 25 consecutive years. Louis Vuitton brand generated about uh, 30 percentage of worldwide revenue from one market called Japan. And this was mainly because of Master's marketing strategy. Next. Next. The focus on creativity, innovation, product lines, each and everything that we talk about. And ultimate result was every girl in their 20s and 30s owned a Louis Vuitton product, like Louis Vuitton product line, like a Louis Vuitton bag or Louis Vuitton wallet, some Louis Vuitton product in Japan, all each and every young girl. Yeah, next. So their strategy was value creation, but they didn't reduce their price. They did not touch their price to get the market share. Kept the prices high, but they focus on value creation. Focusing on product strategy, focusing on play strategy, focusing on promotion strategy. 
but they didn't reduce price. They never offered discount. They never offered coupons. Price was kept always premium price. So several brands show that keeping premium prices high, they can still generate substantial revenue from some, some specific market. That is the actual or classic example for mass stage marketing strategy. Yeah, next. Play strategy, the sell. Uh, normally, they sell only through exclusive stores, but when they implement the real marketing, real mastage marketing strategy, they think about some alternative channels. At the same time, they want to exercise their control. One, one, you know, when a brand is able to do both at the same time simultaneously, that becomes a classic example for mastage marketing. Next. Next, please. Yeah, next, please. Next. Next, next. Next. So here I, I have a pyramid model. In this pyramid model, the previous slide, you can see how it is conceptualized. So a premium brand or a prestigious brand, when they create prestige or premiumness or when they get customers, those who are belonging to middle income group plus some customers from low income group, then it becomes mass T strategy because mass T means mass market plus prestige. You combine both and you get the business from business based on these two dimensions and these two ideas. Next, please. Next, please. And a scientific scale. And this scale is out of uh, 70. And uh, here you have you have seven questions. Like in the next slide, you can see those questions. I like this brand because of mass prestige. I feel like to buy this brand because of mass prestige. I tend to pay high price for this brand because of status. And I can say this at the top of mind brand in my country. I would like to recommend this brand to my friends and relatives. Nothing is more exciting than this brand. So all these scale items are grounded in and in, in brands prestige. So, uh, you know, when, when you have the scale and you get six or seven, for each and every cost, every, 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 every uh, uh, scale item, your total mass stage value, your mass prestige value of your brand will be very high. That means you are, you are a very popular brand and your popularity can be measured using the scale. We have a lot of studies and we had a special issue in general of business research on the same theme. And uh, now this topic is a very, very favorite research area for many young researchers. I know at least 10 PhD students are doing PhD in this area. Some of them are using this scale these days. Yeah, next. Yeah, so this is a scale with the score 0 to 70. Next, please. MMS, the mean score over 60 means the brand is a top of mind brand. And the MMS score 50 to 60 means the brand uh, succeeded in mastage marketing, but it is not a top of the mind brand. The score 40 to 50 means the firm or the brand has not yet succeeded in mastage marketing, but it is possible in the long run. If the score 30 to 40 means brand is not yet accepted well in, a, in, in that specific market, and the score 10 to 30 means brand has failed to create mass prestige. Yeah, next please. So this is a measure which you can use in any sector, in any industry. Only thing is that you need one prestigious brand to compare with other brands. Other brands need not be prestigious brand, but at least one prestigious brand. So next. So for example, in Louis Vuitton, when I did my first paper, Louis Vuitton's mastery value was 60.2 in, in Japan and 56.4 in France. That means they had a relatively high mastery value in a foreign market like Japan. And this is uh, much more than their mastage value in their home market, France. That means uh, it also gives us idea that you can create higher mastage value in a foreign market than your own market, provided you have the appropriate or you have the scientific marketing strategies focusing on the other three dimensions of mastage marketing, product, promotion, and place. Next, next please. Yeah, so my conclusion is if you if you if you focus on this mastage marketing strategy, you can you can have greater market share even during the turbulent times and rousing gain, even in a culturally different foreign market, your own market too. Focus on product strategy, 
product promotion and place. If your product promotion place strategies are great, so your must teach marketing is based on those two strategies and you can have greater performance and, and you can have premium price and you can create a prestigious brand provided you have the right uh, product promotion and place strategies. That is what is all about must teach marketing. Focus on the or target the maximum customers, those who belong to medium group, medium class, as well as some upper low income group. So that is the real mass market and blend the ideas of prestige with them. And you can succeed based on appropriate uh, uh, marketing mix like product promotion and place. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Dash, we can't hear you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Paul. Uh, it was uh, absolutely wonderful uh, listening to you, and especially the, the time that you adhere to in about 19 minutes, you uh, concluded. That's very comfortable for me. Uh, this concept is really very interesting, Mastige. You know, I frankly speaking, I was not aware of this, but uh, with the data that you are showing, I'm sure a lot of business organizations will take serious note of this and uh, uh, with the economy opening up uh, these days, particularly in India, for example, you're talking of $5 trillion economy plan to be achieved next uh, few years. A lot of these uh, top end brands uh, would be coming up and I'm sure the, the concepts that you're talking about would be very handy for some of these organizations, uh, marketing organizations who would be uh, working on this. So thank you once again. Now uh, uh, let's go back to uh, Professor Bell. Uh, is this in control now? Uh, they have received my slides and are still downloading them. So I'm going to start without my slides and hopefully okay. they will catch up midway through. Sure, um, sure. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, let me, you, I have some beautiful slides. I wish you could see these, but I'd be glad to uh, share them with you. To begin, marketing is dead, dead as a doornail. It's been felled by two fatal blows. The first is a shift in control of brands from the marketer to the consumer, which I will expand on in a moment. The second is a shift of many marketing functions from marketing to big data, algorithms, and data analytics. And while we have some use of the output of these analytics and AI that Roland was talking about, uh, we don't really do the analysis and much remains mysterious. So some signs of the shift in control to consumers, uh, food porn is one. And this is when we have um, someone at a restaurant who takes a picture of their beautiful food and uh, then sends it uh, via Twitter or um, WhatsApp or other means and uh, influences. This is benign envy. People envy it. Uh, they, they want to go get something like it and they know where to, to get it now. We also have influencers, uh, bloggers, microbloggers. We have unboxers. Uh, we have intermediary rating organizations like TripAdvisors, where we give a certain number of stars and an explanation to a place where we've stayed. In addition, uh, it, the marketer control is being eroded by brand trolls, by certain memes, by doppelganger brands, which are uh, negative replications of uh, the real brand. And uh, to, to uh, paraphrase Mark Anthony and uh, the funeral oration for Julius Caesar, I come to bury marketing, not to praise it. And so some further signs of loss of marketing functions are the simple existence of Google, Facebook, Baidu, WeChat, WhatsApp, Instagram, uh, and they, they in, allow algorithmic ad placement. And so that means that we're placing ads with people that have searched for something related to our product or our brand but we don't know who they are. So who needs segmentation when we can reach directly the people that are interested? Who needs marketing research when we can directly contact and know what people have searched for? Who needs boxes and arrows? Who needs theory? We can get by quite well without these things that marketing has previously offered. So following along the death of traditional marketing, uh, there's a new sheriff in town and that sheriff ain't marketing. Uh, furthermore, there are, are new outlaws, and some of these are legal outlaws like the Mafang gang. Uh, Mafang is Microsoft, uh, why am I blanking on the F, uh, Facebook, uh, <laughs> Apple, uh, and um, Netflix, and, and Google, uh, and also the other A is uh, alluding me right now. 
Apple, and of, of course, uh, this is uh, trying to buy goods online. We're uh, going through Alexa, uh, but we're going to uh, the, the parent company. The, the, in addition, the sharing economy is telling the death of marketing. Now, for Airbnb, Uber, Task, TaskRabbit, and so forth, there are companies that are intermediaries still, but it's uh, consumer to consumer with those intermediaries. Uh, without much marketing uh, of, of the parent corporation. So there's no need, furthermore, to, to own. We can hire, we can stream, we can have home delivery, we've learned. So the traditional models of distribution are rendered obsolete. Uh, we have a number of ephemeral products that are coming to us um, by streaming, for example, uh, or digital books and so forth. We have online stores and consumers can self-seduce themselves by simply surfing the web and finding delightful new things to want. We also have decentralized brands like Bitcoin. And uh, I'll talk about uh, decentralized or distributed brands a little bit. What they share in common is they have no central authority. And I, I've got here, if you could see the screen, uh, the uh, uh, icons for QAnon, Wikipedia, Bitcoin, uh, and uh, all, all of uh, Hinduism, the, the OM symbol. Uh, at any rate, there's, there's no central authority. There's no C-suite. There's no advertising, PR, services, and customer relations. And therefore, there's no way to respond to crises. And Bitcoin has had a number of crises, like Silk Road uh, selling illegal goods, uh, Mt. Gox, which uh, lost a lot of people their, their Bitcoins, ransomware, which uh, we are told to pay in Bitcoins, and Elon Musk, who uh, a month ago or so shot the uh, price of Bitcoin up to the sky by saying he was now going to accept Bitcoins uh, for Teslas. And then uh, a week or two later, he said, no, it uh, uses too much energy to mine them. I've changed my mind and the price shot back down again. Yet the best of these distributed brands survive and thrive on the publicity and, and bounce back. So uh, distributed and decentralized brands, some examples would be uh, Bitcoin languages. There's no one who has official uh, control of the English language, even uh, the Oxford English Dictionary. Terrorist cells want to be distributed because they don't want to uh, inform on one another. Most memes, Wikipedia, uh, veganism, conspiracy theories like uh, spread by QAnon, DeFi, uh, decentralized finance is getting big. Uh, Hindu religion, uh, there's no central authority, no, there's no pope, uh, there, there's no single sacred book, uh, and so that too is a distributed and uh, decentralized brand. Now there's some advantage of distributed branding, there's no intermediary, uh, direct consumer to uh, seller, uh, it facilitates that matching process. So there needs to be no, there need be no marketing budget. Uh, there's increased efficiency using blockchain and there's basically lower cost of doing business. At the same time, there's some disadvantages because there's no centralized uh, authority. There's no one to legally help, uh, hold accountable. Uh, these entities are slow to adapt and change and they're opposed by existing players. And so governments and banks and other lending institutions are against Bitcoin if they can't control it uh, because they have no way to influence monetary policy or to get their cut uh, over lending uh, and uh, the, the debt that is run up when people use credit cards. But the, another disadvantage finally would be that there's a high failure rate uh, for these things. It's no guarantee to succeed uh, simply by having uh, an unknown uh, author of a particular brand like Bitcoin. So future distributed, uh, the future, I suppose, of distributed and decentralized brands, uh, cryptocurrencies are here to stay. El Salvador has made Bitcoin its official currency. China is working on their own digital currency. Uh, as you know, digital payments in India have uh, taken more people online for using direct payments. Uh, there's also what are called DAOs, uh, DAOs in this case, Distributed Autonomous Organizations. Uh, take, for example, a self-driving car, which gets into an Uber-like uh, driving service, but is also self-owned. Uh, it's been crowdfunded and it's been licensed to itself. So it quickly outcompetes the human drivers because it can operate 24-7 with no labor costs. Uh, it uh, also uh, saves some money for repairs and software upgrades. And it uses some of that money to have children. 
And the way it has children is by setting up other cars that operate just the same. So soon there's a whole fleet of these things. They take over one city and they move on to others. They've uh, taken over this, uh, the uh, ride sharing service. And so they get into uh, cloud farming. They get into planes, trains, and automobiles. They, they take over the entire economy. There's actually been one Dow uh, in Toronto, uh, but it was shut down after a year because it had been hacked for millions of uh, Bitcoins uh, and the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US was investigating. But the whole idea of operating via smart contracts that fulfill themselves uh, without any managerial uh, influence is a really intriguing one. And I think DAOs will be back. One further example, we're seeing the digitization of everything and NFTs or NIFTs as they're called are a good example. So the NBA offers, for example, you could buy LeBron James latest uh, move to the basket and you could own that film clip and no one else could have uh, ownership of it uh, and you would own it forever. Uh, there's actually uh, an Indian man, uh, Vignesh Sundarasan, uh, also known as Medikovan, who bought Mike Winkleman's, uh, actually known as uh, Beebles, uh, painting, uh, actually digital uh, painting, the first 5,000 days. He made one digital painting each day for 5,000 days, and he sold it to Sundarasan for $69.3 million. And Sindharasan said that he would have even gone higher. He wanted to show that Indian people could buy highly luxurious, expensive goods as well. There's also crypto punks who uh, are showing their, uh, in a few pixels, uh, their unique value. And some of those go for uh, tens of millions of dollars as well. So to uh, go on, we have new heroes and disruptors and they're non-marketers. Steve Jobs is a prime example. Uh, Vignesh probably as well, Elon Musk, Jack Dorsey, Jack Ma, none of them succeeded by brilliant marketing or traditional marketing research. Uh, and so as models for the young, our students, for example, engineering, computer science, and design are all more alluring than marketing as a major, better still drop out. Uh, and so we know that uh, Steve Jobs said, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. That's why I never rely on marketing research. Our task is to read things that are not yet on the page. Uh, and we could go back to Henry Ford who said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Uh, they wouldn't have thought of or invented the automobile. And Tesla is a great example here too. It has no advertising, no ad agency, no CMO, no dealer network. And that's not a problem. Uh, it has the highest market cap of any car company bigger than General Motors and Toyota put together. Uh, and it's uh, succeeding quite well. It's opening up uh, factories. It's opened one in uh, Shanghai, uh, soon to open in Berlin and Texas as well. Another thing that uh, is showing the demise or at least the, the de-escalation of marketing and something that COVID made clear is the new focus on supply chain management, logistics, purchasing and os operations. Uh, we learned that outsourcing everything with just in time, uh, which uh, Victoria mentioned, uh, is a fragile system. And so supply chains are now becoming more flexible and redundant. And so putting all your egg cartons in one cargo box leaves you vulnerable. So as marketing focuses on SCM, supply chain management, it recedes to its 19th century focus on transportation. Uh, that's all that's left for marketing. Further, I said I was going to try to provoke you. Furthermore, algorithms and big data are left to the quants and the mathematicians like Roland uh, started out as, uh, not the marketers. So it looks like the parade has passed us by and we are left to clean up the pachyderm poo. So uh, going from that premise, uh, just to sum up so far, uh, there's been a shift of control from marketers to consumers. Uh, there's been a shift to big data and algorithms and data analytics, uh, which uh, Victoria also mentioned, uh, and so did Roland. Uh, and there've been trends away from marketing uh, reinforced by some uh, tech visionaries who said they don't need marketing or marketing research. So as a result, marketing has lost its allure as a student major. Uh, my point of view is consumer culture theory. That's where I'm coming from, but I think these same implications may hold for others. Uh, William T. or Tom Tucker uh, said back in the 1960s, marketers study consumers like fishermen, uh, it should be fisher people, uh, study fish. Uh, so he said we should be more like the ichthyologists, more like the biologists who studied fish. 
well, I would rather study consumers in the wild rather than on the dissection table and do ethnographic research. I think by studying Uber drivers, garage sailors, eBay traders, and Airbay hosts, uh, we learn something about the basic process of marketing, exchange, and acquisition, which have lasted for millennia. So we're now saying some stability amid instability. Marketing's traditional functions are not going away. Someone has to perform them. Uh, but they're being done more, and by, more by the machines that Roland emphasized, uh, the thinking machines in this case. So there are shift in terms of who and what does what uh, in these traditional marketing functions. So marketing is doing fine. I would argue that it's our text and our academics that uh, Victoria mentioned who, who must evolve. So we need curriculum change. And among that curriculum uh, change is not just adopt teaching adoption and diffusion of innovations. We need to teach how do we give birth to the next Steve Jobs or Elon Musk? How do we nurture the next Bob Dylan or John Lennon? How do we encourage the next Star Trek or Star Wars? And since we can't all expect abductive, passionate product and service breakthroughs, how do we teach creative copying? We need more blue ocean products, fewer rationalized extensions of product lines, uh, more of the same, and more qualitative research into big data and algorithmic targeting effects. So who are these consumers that the ad algorithm has located? We also need to challenge ourselves as academics. Tech heroes have helped question the relevance of old marketing ideas, and so we need new ones, and we need new techniques. Uh, we're not going to find by emulating two by two psych experiments, not by borrowing theories, not by structural equation marketing, not by focus groups and survey research. But I would argue we need more ethnographic, netnographic, observational research with depth inter interviews and projective methods. We need to reawaken the exquisite corpse of marketing. I had a nice illustration where I could show you what the exquisite, exquisite corpse of marketing looks like, but I think if, if you Google it, you can find it, or I'll share my slides. So we need some wake up exercises. We, we need to reinvigorate ourselves. We need to read the other, that is other methods, other topics, other disciplines, and other places than those that we would normally go to. When you find something new, follow up with Google Scholar searches of the new authors and topics. Follow their Twitter feeds, Facebook posts, and LinkedIn posts. Take a plunge into new academic ponds, that is, journals and conferences. Go to conferences that you would never go to or, or think about uh, previously. Computer-human interaction, for example. Uh, sociology of uh, history of uh, consumption. So take new puzzles into the classroom provide them to our students. Before we can invigorate, reinvigorate marketing, we must reinvigorate ourselves. And so with that, uh, I'll say thank you. I think I maybe went through this more quickly without uh, the slides than I would have uh, with the slides. And it looked like uh, they never did catch up with me. Uh, so uh -huh. I'm through and uh, maybe I left slides so that we uh, time so that we can all take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ben. That, that was, was really, really yeah, yeah. there's an echo coming come here. Yeah. Can, can you, can you, can you also, also again? Yeah. No, have I audible clearly? clearly? Yes. So, okay, okay. okay. The echo is coming here, back to me. To me. Oh, I'll, I'll manage it. Uh, uh, so it was a really interesting um, um, presentation and the thoughts that you shared, um, really mind boggling, you know, the, the telling marketing professors that the, the marketing is dead. And you gave a wonderful example of Elon Musk and uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, very good example, particularly the Elon Musk uh, car company example. And we all need to uh, take a lot of learning out of this as to how do we also uh, reconfigure or the reincarnation of uh, marketing, how and what would be the elements of the uh, new uh, 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 ways of uh, doing uh, marketing. So that was very interesting and I'm very much uh, um, happy to have listened to all uh, four wonderful and uh, learned speakers uh, this uh, uh, afternoon or morning. Now we can take some questions. Um, there's only one question um, that has come in the chat box, but those who are listening and ask questions in the Q&A box, uh, I'll be able to see that and read. Uh, but before we get any more questions, uh, I have one question uh, to uh, Roland uh, when he was talking of uh, feeling economy. Uh, you know, feeling economy is, is was a very interesting concept uh, that how the world is changing. 
and uh, AI taking over the world. Uh, I can also remind my own time when I uh, saw that movie called AI by Steven uh, Spielberg. So maybe we are heading towards that kind of a, uh, a catastrophic situation uh, when the AI takes over. So the, essentially the feeling is left to the humans. So uh, can you give uh, a specific example of uh, uh, any business enterprise, take any business enterprise name, um, or I can suggest any name, like you take Elon Musk, a car company, or any company's example, uh, how this feeling economy is going to impact that particular uh, company's uh, business uh, operations? Roland, am I, is this clear? Can't hear you, Roland. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me? Roland, you are... Okay, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, I, I, I look at um, the, um, the the companies that, that are currently uh, doing the best in terms of uh, uh, profitability and uh, market cap. And uh, one example that immediately comes to mind is Facebook. I mean, you look at Facebook and you say, well, shoot, this is just enabling people to talk to each other. How important can that be? But, uh, but really, uh, that's exactly what the feeling economy is all about. All these people with their AI smartphones in their pockets uh, can now use this to become more involved with other people. They can become um, more... Uh, empathetic because they have the ability to interact with these people more uh, all the time. And so uh, Facebook uh, really seized on what the feeling economy was becoming uh, before people realized how important that was. Could I maybe also answer that? Uh, sure, sure, why not? <laughs> uh, I have a paper coming out in Journal of Service Research uh, about sex robot sex workers. And uh, there's a company called Real Dolls. Uh, it's just moved from California to Las Vegas that makes these very realistic uh, dolls um, because they, they don't have any ability to walk uh, or talk thus far. But they're putting AI into them now. And so they'll be able to have uh, conversations uh, and they'll be able to keep eye contact and they'll be able to eventually uh, move more uh, effectively. This sex is a boom economy right now. You, you mentioned uh, AI, uh, Gigolo Joe was one of the characters uh, in AI. And we're seeing uh, now, especially the female uh, equivalent of that uh, marketed to, to males. And I think AI is going to be a, a breaking point uh, in being able to call these sex robots uh, rather than sex dolls. Um, and it's something that's a little bit under the radar. Uh, and like the rest of my talk, trying to provoke people, uh, I guess I would offer that as a further example. Yeah, well, that's uh, interesting. Um, um, uh, the, I see some um, observation in the chat box. Uh, there's one which was posted a while ago. Uh, so I think uh, Professor Paul can uh, look at that. Uh, but it's a very simple uh, observation. All it says is, uh, how is luxury brand different from Mastige brand in characteristics and in marketing strategy? Yeah. Justin, if, can you? Yeah, yeah, I can, yeah, I can answer. Can you hear me? Yeah. So. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, for me, any prestigious brand is a mastage brand for me. It can be a luxury brand or it can be, it can be a just premium brand. And, and, uh, it varies like, uh, based on the context also, for example, Apple, Apple is a mastage brand in Indian market, but Apple is not a mastage brand in American market because every Tom and Harry has, uh, it's, it's an ordinary, ordinary man's brand in America. But in India, Apple is a classic prestigious brand. So uh, I would consider Apple as a mastage brand or a prestigious brand in Indian market. But I, I can also say that Apple has succeeded in the mass market in America. So that way, if I say that Apple is Apple success in America, Apple is a mastage brand in America too. But uh, if I if I use the scale that I showed, the score that we will be getting would be different for Apple in America and Apple in India. So, so for me, to, to be specific to this question, any prestigious brand can be simply called as mastage brand. I do not want to classify as 
this Starbucks is uh, not mastige or Apple is not mastige, only Louis Vuitton is mastige. I don't want to say that. So I would say that any prestigious brand is a mastige brand. Yeah, that's correct. So essentially, uh, why call it prestige? I mean, any uh, um, brand with um, mass appeal uh, can be fitted into the uh, mastige brand, no? It has to be, mastige means mass and prestige. It has to be prestigious brand. Uh, prestige is a relative term. So yeah. somebody who's in the lower economic strata, the a hundred in a one dollar I have said hundred dollar item is a prestige uh, product. But somebody who's in a very high income bracket, for this person a million dollar item is a prestige item. So prestige is a relative term. So what I'm trying to say is as long as with a product valuation, um, mass is there. That means the volume is there. Uh, your model should be applicable. Yeah, so so the prestige in the minds of maximum customers. So yeah. that is the idea. So maximum yeah. customers should feel that this is prestigious. Then you can simply call it as mass prestige. Yeah, yeah that's it. So I have one more uh, question, observation from uh, the uh, Pro uh, Professor Sriparna, uh, our faculty. Um, um, this is uh, this can be responded to by Professor Rust, uh, or and or Professor uh, Bell. I'll just read it. Uh, I hope uh, I'm clear enough. It says the scope and efficiency of uh, machine influence is intense. To what extent is the consumer unconscious in getting restructured by such influences? Uh, for example, in Japan, the AI priestess, the priest, is becoming a huge success. Uh, so that is for both uh, uh, Professor Rust and Professor Bell. So AI. Uh, is becoming a very successful way of uh, conducting uh, a religious ceremony in uh, Japan. So the question is uh, uh, the, the the scope of efficiency of uh, machine influence is in, intense these days. So to what extent the consumer uh, is not aware of this? This is what I think is the meaning here. The consumer is unconscious of this. And then, therefore, ultimately, it will impact the the way we do things. I think absolutely. Uh, in fact, that was uh, one of the things that I tried to emphasize in the talk was that this is not just changing what people do; it's changing who they are. And uh, I mean that because, based on what people do, they store different memories in their brain, and they develop different skills and abilities. And uh, if, if you don't need the calculation abilities, then you lose that and then you then uh, do something else to, to fill, uh, fill that particular part of your brain. And so uh, I, I'm seeing this as a profound change. And I think basically people are, are much less rational. They're more emotional. You're seeing that everywhere. You're seeing that in, in politics, for example. You, you see uh, emotional appeals now to a far greater extent than you did even 10 years ago. Yeah, I could maybe chime in with something that uh, I'm co-editing the second edition of the Handbook of Digital Consumption. And uh, this is because the digital is still new. Uh, if we were to say that we're going to instead do the Handbook of Electricity Consumption, people would just laugh because we've taken electricity for granted and it's in the background. Uh, and when things go in the background is when they tend to have the greatest effect. But I don't think this requires uh, the digital. Uh, if you go to Tibet, you'll see Tibetan prayer wheels that are uh, a, a water is operating them. And so the stream flows over them and the prayers go around in a circle and go up to uh, the heavens. And so it's automating the process of prayer. Uh, and so as in uh, Japan uh, with machines taking over some of the sacred ceremonies, uh, this is something that has been around for hundreds of years in, in Tibet. Yeah, that's good. Um, this, is, this is one. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Professor um, uh, Bell. Um, this one observation, I think after this we'll close because this time is almost um, five minutes more than what was allotted to us. Uh, this is one of the observation. It says that the success of startups in different product or service category uh, by these uh, startup people without they having any thorough understanding of the consumer or the market. It blows the myth about uh, uh, the uh, understanding the subject matter. So their startups are very successful, 
uh, and the startup guys have no background on understanding market or consumer. So, uh, you know, this is an observation. I take it this way. So therefore, you know, the way we are moving the, the web 2.0 or the new way industry 4.0. Uh, so with these kinds of things coming up, uh, the way I understand from the person who asked this question, uh, the marketing is dead. Yeah, so, so any take on this? There are a lot of successful people without any marketing orientation and marketing background. I can answer that. Um, you know, one thing that, that we don't um, realize when we say something like, uh, oh, look, this startup became hugely successful. Therefore, we should be like that startup. We don't realize there may be a thousand companies like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 999 of them have failed because they didn't do the things you're talking about. Very true. Uh, and in fact, the, the venture capitalist guys, you know, they have their equation around this only. They invest in 1000 companies and they hope only one of them succeed and which is they, they make their money. So, so, so there's a darker side to the story of failed startups. Uh, and they might not have failed if they had done their marketing things uh, properly. So maybe we can uh, take it uh, 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 this way. Um, uh, there is a may ob same observation. So it's uh, seven minutes past the time allotted to us. Uh, uh, I think we should uh, uh, close uh, this uh, session with the last uh, but not the you know, least observation of what uh, uh, Victoria was talking about, the marketing as a subject matter. Uh, the marketing students must be fully aware of the way uh, the disruption is happening. So the marketing uh, subject matter and the professors need to be conscious of the disruption in the uh, uh, the, the learning ability of the students, the marketing students, as well as the pedagogy that is used to uh, train these uh, uh, graduates uh, is, is going to be very crucial uh, for ultimate uh, success of the uh, academic uh, program. Uh, with these words, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Russell uh, Bulk, Professor Roland Rust, Professor Victoria Crittenden and Professor Justin Paul uh, for being with us this uh, afternoon and sharing their uh, wonderful views and very insightful uh, perspectives on the marketing theme. And it was truly a learning experience for all of us, uh, including the audience who would have been uh, uh, listening to us. And I'm sure we will have more opportunities in the future to interact with you and learn more from uh, you uh, as we interact with you. Thank you. Thank you once again. And thank you, uh, Nirmalya, and thank you, Ansh, for being with us and uh, taking us through uh, the, uh, the, the the entire uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah.